Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. Luke chapter 2, A Savior is Born. This will be the next in our series of teachings from the Gospel of Luke as we look at Jesus, the Son of Man. Matthew reveals him as the King of Kings, Mark as the Suffering Servant, Luke as the Son of Man, John as the Son of God. So as we consider Luke's perspective, a Gentile writing to Gentiles, The thing that fascinates me is the humanity of Jesus that is revealed, and it's a great mystery that God would become flesh and and live among us. Um, It's a mystery beyond my mental comprehension, but some things I think are best left to mystery so that we can embrace them with faith and simply trust that God is who he says he is, that God will do what he says he will do, and that scripture, as it reveals the Lord Jesus, is uh, trustworthy, and that we can have our put our faith in God and believe what the scripture says concerning him. So it, it it's especially interesting towards the end of Luke, after his resurrection, that Jesus took them through the scriptures and taught them all the things that are written concerning himself. So the scriptures are very valuable in helping us to um, to better understand this mystery, but I don't want to give the impression that uh, we can, we can uh, totally solve it just by using the power of logic or rational intellectual pursuit of the scriptures. If that's the case, then um, we would not need the Holy Spirit. But we we need that wisdom and that revelation to bring us into the depths of Christ. The scriptures can certainly help and lead us in that direction. So it's a real pleasure to go into this gospel of Luke with that understanding and to embrace both the divinity of Jesus as well as the humanity of Jesus. He became a man so that he could save men. And by that I mean mankind, humankind, the sons of Adam, all of whom have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and really the children of Adam. By children I mean the sons and the daughters of Adam, uh, that first man, who sinned and fell short of the glory of God, and so uh, mankind has been in this lost and fallen state uh, up until this time that Jesus, the promise of the Father, is revealed. And so Luke chapter 2 gives us the circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus, and we will divide Luke chapter 2 and study it in four divisions. Number one, the birth of of Jesus in Bethlehem, number two, the angels and shepherds, number three, Simeon and Anna, and number four, the boy Jesus in the temple. The temple is very prominent in the life of Jesus because the temple was prominent in Jerusalem, and both Jerusalem and the temple were prominent in Jewish life and in Jewish culture and in the Jewish religion. But Luke is the only one that gives us a portrait of Jesus as a child in the temple. We are familiar with Jesus going into the temple to cleanse the temple, to uh, chase out the money changers and to overturn their tables. We are familiar with Jesus healing in the temple and teaching in the temple. Uh, But Luke is the only one who tells us about the boy Jesus in the temple. So this will be very interesting and unique as we consider Luke chapter 2 together. Let's begin in verse 1 of Luke 2 as we consider the birth in Bethlehem. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And of course this refers to the Roman world, 
the Roman Empire was the world, the, the dominant world power at that time. Um, so this is the sense in which scripture says that a decree went out that all the world should be registered. We understand that to mean all the Roman world. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with his with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Well, isn't that interesting? I want to go back and briefly touch upon the prophetic and scriptural significance of the Messiah and where the Messiah would be born. Well, in Micah 4, 2, we find the key text where the prophets foretell that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 4, 2 says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephaphra, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old from everlasting. So the the rabbis and the scholars understood, the scribes understood this to mean that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a few miles outside of Jerusalem. And so this was the prophecy of the Messiah. Joseph actually fulfills prophecy in a couple of ways. First, in his lineage through David. So the prophecy uh, of the Messiah also included the fact that this Messiah would be of the sons of David. And, and to understand the significance of this, you would have to have an understanding of the Old Testament and of David and God's promise to David that David would always have a son to rule on the throne and that this throne would endure forever. Well, of course, a lot of people taking that literally thought this meant that the kingdom of Israel would continue and last forever, and uh, that was not literally fulfilled. But even David, whom the book of Acts refers to as a prophet, of course, he was a king and a, and a psalmist, but in a certain sense also he was a prophet, it says in the book of Acts, and even David understood that this was not intended to be literal, but that it referred to the Messiah as the Son of God and to an everlasting kingdom that he may not have fully appreciated or understood, but had the sense that this was not something that was going to be a literal fulfillment in the way that everybody expected. Of course, it's the tendency of people to take everything literally. And so um, we find that Joseph is of the lineage of David, which is important to the prophecy, but also this birth in Bethlehem. And, you know, Jesus is known as Jesus of Nazareth because that's where Joseph and Mary are living. They are living in Nazareth and she's pregnant. Well, for this prophecy to be fulfilled, and Jesus, interestingly enough, says that the scripture cannot be broken. You know, we sometimes handle the scriptural, the scriptures without the reverence, I think, that we should, uh, because we, we see them as writings and uh, not as something that cannot be broken. But Jesus says they can't be broken. And so here is Joseph and Mary living in Nazareth, and how would the Messiah be born in Bethlehem when they are living in Nazareth? I mean, that's a good uh, uh, 90 miles to the north of Bethlehem. It's a three days journey. Well, in the providence of God, we see that 
As it so happened that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the Roman world should be registered, and this required each person to go back to the city of their birth and be registered in this census. So Luke shares this, I believe, to illustrate how even though it seems that the Romans are judging and governing and doing things according to their thought and according to their whim, nevertheless, the Most High God rules in the affairs of men and certainly rules in the affairs of the Roman Empire. And so without realizing it, Caesar Augustus fulfills the very words of God and fulfills the very scriptures so that God arranges for Joseph and Mary to have a really good reason to go back to Bethlehem. And we see that reason is far beyond the understanding and the ability of Caesar or even Joseph and and Mary to understand, uh, but that we know, looking at it, we know that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. So I hope that is encouraging to you, even if you cannot connect the dots of your existence. Even if you're traveling and you're journeying through life does not always make sense. We can trust that if we put God's will and God's kingdom ahead of our own, then God is arranging things exactly the way he wants them to be exactly in the time and in the season and in the place of his own choosing. Well, it it brings up an interesting question. And the the question is, what is the Messiah? When we talk about um, the, the scriptures and the prophecies of the Messiah and that the Jews were expecting the Messiah, what exactly are we talking about? Well, the Hebrew word for Messiah, it's Strong's number 4899 in the Hebrew. It's Mashiach. And that's where we get the transliteration of Messiah in English. It's Mashiach in Hebrew, and it means anointed one or one who is anointed. And, you know, it's used in scripture more than once, and it could refer to any consecrated person, any anointed person, anointed as a king or a priest or a saint. God even refers to Cyrus the king of the Medes and the Persians, as his anointed or his Mashiach. But eventually this term became associated with the Messiah, not just any consecrated person, but the Messiah, the future king of Israel, who would be ruler of, of Israel and would deliver the people from their enemies. And at this point in time, at this point in scripture, the enemy was Rome. Before that, the enemy was Greece, Alexander. And before that, the enemy was the Medes and the Persians, Cyrus. And before that, the enemy was Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar and the different kings of Babylon. Before that, it was Assyria. But all of these world powers, and there is a little Israel caught in the in the middle, surrounded by enemies, uh, geographically, spiritually, politically, much the same as they are today. So this term Mashiach or Messiah became associated with the idea of a deliverer, someone who would save the people from their enemies. And um, so isn't it interesting, human nature, of course, tends to take the promises of God and translate them into political benefit, uh, political uh, blessing. And uh, I could certainly understand uh, living in Israel and, and being occupied by a foreign Government occupied by a foreign army, hostile to Israel and hostile to uh, Judaism. It's certainly 
gives people hope. And if I were a politician, I would probably, living in that time, I would probably uh, try to encourage people along the lines that God would send us a Messiah. He would send us a king of Israel who was going to save us and deliver us. And in the meantime, we just do the best that we can. So I can see, maybe you can see as well, uh, the mindset that people were more interested in political salvation than any kind of a spiritual salvation, than any kind of a sense that what we need deliverance from is our sins. They wanted to be delivered from the Romans. They wanted to be delivered from their enemies. They did not see themselves as sinful and in need of a savior. They saw themselves as persecuted and in need of a deliverer from their enemies. It makes total sense to the natural man. I can certainly empathize with it. However, uh, that uh, mistaken impression of who the Messiah would be and what the Messiah would do would ultimately lead to so much um, so much sorrow as Israel rejected their Messiah because that Messiah would then say that my kingdom is not of this world and he refused to be made king by force because that's not the kind of king and not the kind of kingdom that he represents. So um, all of this will be will be revealed in Luke in due season, but we have to understand the expectation and why people had the false impressions that they did and the circumstances in which those impressions were formed. So Messiah is uh, referencing that Hebrew word Mashiach, and when you read it in English, you see the name Jesus Christ. Well, Christ, being written in Greek, is Strong's number 5547, Christos, which is the Greek equivalent of Mashiach, or Mashiach in Hebrew, but it also means anointed. So Christos is the Greek equivalent of Mashiach, but both of them mean anointed. And so, Yeshua HaMashiach, in Hebrew, means the same as Jesus Christos in Greek. And what we would say, Jesus Christ, in English, but all of these things mean anointed Savior. Anointed Savior. So, Yeshua or Hebrew Yehoshua. These meant the Lord is salvation. And Iesus is simply the Greek transliteration of Yehoshua, or Yeshua, in Aramaic. And so this is how these terms come to us. But more than how you say it in a particular language, the meaning is, is what I want to get across to you that Jesus is the anointed Savior. The anointed Savior. Very important to keep that in mind, that he has not come to destroy the world, but to save the world. He has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because God has anointed him to be the Savior of all mankind. And this certainly fits in with the portrait that the Gospel of Luke presents to us as Jesus, the Son of Man. He had to become a man so that he could save men. He had to become human so that he could save humankind. And of course, when I say men, I'm referring to women as well. I'm referring to all the children of Adam. All of us who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all of us like sheep have gone astray, each one of us have turned aside to our own way. And how quickly we forget that the only reason that we are who we are today, if we are saved at all, it is because God has sent us an anointed Savior. 
anointed and chosen by God to be the Savior of the world. So we we pass on from that to the next section of the chapter, beginning in, beginning in verse 8 with the angels and the shepherds and the angelic announcement of this momentous occasion. In verse 8, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that these shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. So the interesting thing about Bethlehem, among other things, besides being the city of David, the reason it's the city of David uh, is because David and his family were born there, but it's also where David kept the flocks. David was a shepherd, and he, as the youngest, he was expected to uh, do his share of watching over the flocks. Well, Bethlehem, in the time of Jesus, uh, Bethlehem is where they kept the flocks of sheep for all the sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem. So there's some prophetic significance and parallel there, I believe. But in a, a larger sense as well, it's important that we understand w- how people looked upon shepherding. Shepherding sheep was a lowly occupation. It's not something that people wanted to do. It was something that was very often looked down upon. And that's why David was keeping the sheep and his older brothers were off to war because the job usually fell to the youngest in the family. It's and it's kind of like taking out the trash. You know, it's got to be done, but nobody really wants to do it. And sometimes uh, um, the the job gets passed down and passed down and usually falls to the youngest in the family. Uh, but it's it's not something that um, that anyone would enjoy doing. Well, shepherding was like that. Uh, it was lonely. It was cold. You had to do it. At, you had to watch over the flocks at night because that's when all the predators and the enemies would come up to try and steal the flock, or to to injure or to kill kill the shepherd or kill the sheep. So uh, you had to stay up all night and keep an eye on things, and it, it, it wasn't a fun job. So isn't it interesting then that, and fitting that the birth of Jesus, the Savior of all men, created an unusual angelic outbreak of celebration that we have not seen before or since, but that this angelic outbreak of celebration and praise and worship and glory to God in the highest, it's hidden from everybody on the earth. And it's only revealed, the only people who see and witness this host from heaven of angels 
a multitude of heavenly hosts. The only people seeing this open heaven right now are a few isolated, lonely, and lowly shepherds out in the middle of nowhere near Bethlehem in the middle of the night. <laughs> I think it's it's very appropriate. God didn't reveal any of this to the priest or to the scribes or the Pharisees or the teachers of the law, but he revealed it to the lowest, <laughs> loneliest people in the middle of the night while everyone else is asleep. Now, the announcement of the angels is also consistent with Luke's gospel in his presentation of Jesus as the Son of Man and the Savior of all. First, the angels, the angel says that good tidings, good tidings, good news of great joy for all people. And second, the announcement says peace and goodwill towards men. And again, that word men is anthropos, which means mankind or humankind. Peace and goodwill towards all men, all mankind, all people. So good tidings of great joy for all people, peace and goodwill towards all mankind. Goodwill is Strong's number 2107, Eudokia, which means good pleasure, kindly intent, delight, and satisfaction. Once again, revealing the heart of God is not to destroy, but to save. But God so loved the world that he sent his only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. So that's good news. Especially when religion is teaching that God wants to destroy the earth. Can't wait to destroy sinners and bad people. Well, this is good tidings of great joy for all people. And it's peace from God and it's goodwill towards God's creation, mankind. It signals God's kindly intent, his beneficence. That God is good and his mercy endures forever. And Jesus is the expression of God's good pleasure. It's not that God finds pleasure in sin, but he means to deliver the sinner and destroy the sin, not destroy the sinner in the process. So this is good news, much better than the, than the bad news that religion brings. This is good tidings of great joy for all people. Hallelujah. So again, this is consistent with Luke's gospel. These announcements from the angels, this great angelic celebration, support Luke's view that the birth of Jesus indicates God's good intentions, his, his heart, his mind, his desire towards all people, not just Israel, but to all, to all people, to all mankind. And since most of the people listening to me right now are Gentiles, that means to us. Otherwise, if we're not born in Israel, then that's too bad, so sad for us. But that's not the good news. The good news of the birth of Jesus and these angelic announcements, they indicate God's goodwill and his good intention towards all people, not Revealing this to priests and kings and the, the people that you would expect, you know, not the presidents and the prime ministers of the world, not the Caesars in Rome, but revealing this good news to ordinary shepherds in the middle of the night. And then so they go to Bethlehem and they behold this king that the angels are celebrating. Maybe that's what they were expecting anyway. They don't say that a king is born. They say a savior is born who is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed. And being Jews, they were probably expecting something like a king, the king of the Jews. 
but they found a child not dressed in royal royal robes and not in a palace fit for kings, but wrapped in cloths and lying in a feed trough, in a stable, or perhaps in a cave, because there was no room for them in the end. And so this is the portrait of Luke. Jesus, the Son of Man, God becoming a baby. All of God and all of man, not coming as a prince or as a king in his palace, but coming as a baby in a feeding trough. Now, for most people, that's the extent of their understanding of what come, has come to be known as the Christmas story, where we, once a year, we take time to talk about Christmas, to perhaps celebrate Christmas, perhaps celebrate the birth of Jesus, among other things that people do at that time of the year. But that's not all that there is to the story of the birth of Jesus, and that's not all that there is to the story of this child that has been revealed. We continue reading in Luke chapter 2, in verse 21, and consider Jesus as a child, or Jesus as a baby, and then growing into a child. And again, this is unique to Luke. No one else shares this level of detail. And so many people believe that Luke got his information directly from Mary. Otherwise, how would anyone know that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart? So it's nice to think someone like Luke getting the story with great precision and accuracy, perhaps from Mary herself, who shared these things that no one else would have known or could have known because she pondered them all in her heart and revealed them to Luke, who now reveals them to us. So we get to see further glimpses of the early years of Jesus. It brings us to the third division of Luke, chapter 2, with Simeon and Anna, beginning in verse 21. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons." I've read this three or four times as I've prepared for it. <laughs> and every time I, I come to this, I just get broken up. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. 
Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. You see, up to that point, everything had been glory to God and peace on earth, goodwill towards men, a king is born, a savior is born, the Messiah, the promise of God, everything is happy, everything is wonderful. But only because they didn't see the cross in this child's future. All they saw was sitting on the throne and ruling and reigning. They didn't see the cross. They didn't see the terrible price that would have to be paid. Well, Luke, writing for his Gentile audience, describes the Jewish ritual of purification for Mary and the dedication for Jesus. All of this is according to the law of Moses, Jesus being the firstborn. And Luke records that they offered as a sacrifice a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons, which was the alternative You were supposed to offer a lamb, if you could afford the lamb, but if you could not afford a lamb, you could offer two pigeons or two turtle doves instead. And so this tells us that that Joseph and Mary were not people of great wealth, (laughs) not people of great means, not people of abundance, but they were obedient to the law of the Lord. The other interesting thing about this that is not recorded anywhere else, this interaction here with Simeon. Amazingly, and this word behold is used a lot by Luke, but here's another behold moment. We're introduced to yet another person filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not as though the Holy Spirit only filled people after the day of Pentecost, but here is yet another person that we see being filled with the Holy Spirit, a man named Simeon, just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And God had revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die, he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So again, only found in Luke is Simeon's prophecy here that embraces both Jews and Gentiles, and by embracing both, he embraces all. And that's my point. Simeon says, My eyes have seen your salvation prepared before the face of all peoples. This is what I want to get across to you, that Jesus is the Savior of all. And Simeon refers to him, not as you would expect, only as the consolation of Israel. But first, he says, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. You see, Israel was supposed to be God's rescue mission to reach the rest of the world. But someone has said that Israel, while driving the ambulance, to rescue the rest of the world, crashed (laughs) off the side of the road in the middle of the rescue mission and had to be rescued themselves. Then the greatest stumbling block to saving the world was actually the Jews through whom God was trying to save the world through. And so in Jesus, we see all the promises of God fulfilled to Abraham, that in you and in your seed all the nations will be blessed, and Simeon, led by the Holy Spirit, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, acknowledges that, that this child will be a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. 
but then, of course, the terrible price of that salvation for all, because what no one completely realized is that this child would be rejected, not as a child, but as a man. And Simeon says this child is set for the fall, and King James Version says the rising again, the fall and rising again of many in Israel. You see, Paul would later declare in Romans chapter 11 that all Israel will be saved, but it's going to come at a terrible fall and a terrible rising again. Death, burial, and resurrection. You're not going to get away from it. God's end is resurrection but the the way to which the only way to get to resurrection is through death and this is the sign spoken spoken against it's the cross this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel a sign spoken against and he says a sword will pierce your heart as well and the hearts of many will be revealed and they'll be revealed for who they are Jesus the living word, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart, revealing the hypocrite, restoring the sinner. And all of this is part of what Mary sang in, in her song in Luke chapter 1. From generation to generation he has shown strength with his arm, scattered the proud, put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly, filled the hungry with good things, and sending the rich away empty. So she's pondering these things in her heart, and then Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, gives us a foreshadowing of what to expect. Well, there's more to this, and that we resume in verse 36. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. I love Anna. I've talked about Anna uh, many times before and written about her and about how she never left the temple, but she ministered to the Lord night and day. But what I want to point out to you here is verse 38, where it says in that instant, while Simeon is blessing the baby Jesus, it says that she came in that instant and gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him, of Jesus, to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Now, what I see in this is that Anna spoke of a person to all those looking for redemption in a city. To all those looking for redemption in Jerusalem, all of those looking for redemption in Judaism, all of those looking for redemption in the temple and in the priesthood and in the law of Moses and in their religion that they had constructed. That Anna spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in other things. To all those who looked for redemption in the temple of God, all those who looked for redemption in the city of God, all those who looked for redemption in the people of God. But Anna spoke of him to all those 
and spoke of him that they should look not to the temple of God, not to the city of God, not to the people of God, but to the Son of God, who is the Son of Man, Jesus, the Savior of the world. So then we come to the fourth and final section of Luke chapter 2. And this is the childhood of Jesus, which culminates in his appearing in the temple. So verse 39 says that when they had performed performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Again, this was commanded in the law of Moses. It was three feasts that you were supposed to travel to Jerusalem to observe, and Passover was the the greatest and most important of those feasts. So then from verse 41 to verse 42, we fast forward 12 years. And this would be Jesus' last Passover when he is 12 years old. It would be his last Passover before his bar mitzvah when he's 13, which according to Jewish custom is when a child becomes an adult. You memorize a portion of the law of Moses and you recite it. And this marks the rite of passage from childhood to adulthood. Well, I don't think 13 qualifies as an adult, but I'm telling you the Jewish custom. So we fast forward 12 years. And now it says that when he was, when Jesus was 12 years old, again, this story is only found in Luke. You'll not find it anywhere else. They went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast, and when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, twelve years old, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. So once again, this reinforces the idea that Luke is getting his information straight from Mary. If she pondered these things and kept them in her heart, and she only revealed them to Luke, then that would explain why Luke and Luke alone sharing is able to share these very intimate details and stories with us. So it says Jesus was missing three days before they found him in the temple. So it was a day's journey from Jerusalem, it says, and before they realized he was not with them, and then a day's journey to get back to Jerusalem, and then a day spent looking for him in Jerusalem before they found him in the temple. Now, it says that he was sitting in the temple, listening and asking questions. But the thing to understand is that he's not there as a student. He's not listening to people and asking questions the way a student, in our mind, would hear something and ask questions because they don't understand. But he is there in the temple asking questions the way a Jewish rabbi 
would go about teaching in the way the Jewish way of teaching is to ask provocative and difficult questions. So when Jesus is there in the temple asking questions, he's actually teaching. He's also listening and he is astonishing the other rabbis and teachers with his understanding and his answers being only 12 years old. Well, asking questions is the Jewish way of teaching, and Jesus asked many questions in his teachings, and um, they can be quite provocative and they can be quite difficult. It's not about having great answers as much as it is coming up with difficult, unsolvable questions. And for example, Jesus asked a question once, if the Messiah is the son of David, why does David call him Lord? <laughs> right? If the Messiah is the son of David, that means that David is the father of the Messiah. Then why does David call his son Lord? Now, we know the answer to that. But that stumped them. They could not figure it out. They couldn't explain it. And then he would ask him another provocative and difficult question. The baptism of John. Does it come from heaven or does it come from men? And so immediately <laughs> they are thrown into confusion. Well, if we say it came from men, then the people will stone us. And if we say the bat that he came from heaven, then he'll ask us, why didn't we believe him? And so all they can say is, uh, we don't know. <laughs> so this is the Jewish way of teaching and making your point is to ask provocative and difficult questions. And Jesus was great at this. Even at 12 years old, he was filled with wisdom and with teaching ability. He would ask questions like, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things that I say? <laughs> so this was an astonishing thing and kind of amazing. Now, the interesting thing is how verse 49 is often translated and different translations say different things. So when I said when I read verse 49 from the New King James Version, yours may be different. Mine says, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Well, other translations say, uh, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Well, this is quite a discrepancy. So I looked it up. I want to know what the original Greek says. Why, why is there such a discrepancy? Well, when I looked it up in the original Greek, which you can do yourself online, or you can look it up in a New Testament that has the Greek, the literal Greek next to it. Well, it doesn't say business and it doesn't say house. It actually doesn't even have a word there. It only says father. So then it all comes down to that word and it's a, a preposition, about. I must be about my father's business. Well, if business is not there and house is not there, I must be about my father. Well, that Greek word there that's being translated as about can be translated lots of different ways depending on the context. So it could just mean, very simply, since it only says father, did you not know that I would be with my father or be in my father or be with my father? But it doesn't say house and it doesn't say business. I think because that phrase is not very clear, I think the translators put that in there to try and make sense of the context. But once again, it's another question that it's difficult to answer. And this is <laughs> Jesus once again, even at the age of 12, demonstrating his wisdom, his spiritual communion with his father, 
We see all of that consistent throughout his life, even as a child, and all the way up into manhood. So when God wanted to send his son to earth, God had all kinds of options. He might have sent him in all of his power and glory as a deity, suddenly appearing on top of a mountain or or descending from a cloud or appearing in the temple or showing up in a palace someplace. But Luke's gospel reveals Jesus as the promised Messiah, yes, but from the perspective of becoming human in order to save humans. The children were flesh and blood, and so he himself likewise took part in the same. Jesus is born in humble surroundings, and like any other child, Jesus, having humbled himself, had to grow and increase in wisdom and favor, just like you and I do, emptying himself and becoming flesh and blood, just like you and you and me. Luke also shows that Jesus is the Savior of all people. It's good news for all, both Jew and Gentile. But he also shows through Simeon's prophecy that the way of the cross will be a difficult way, unexpected, not easily understood, and not readily accepted or embraced, and that the Jewish Messiah would be very different from what anyone expected him to be. If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com.